So, the next 12 minutes, why did I choose this topic and why focus on China? I want to take you through some of my travels and my key highlights. What did I find out? And hopefully give you a couple of pearls of wisdom as to what I think we need to do in the meat industry. I stand here now in a, in a funny position because when I say we in the meat industry, technically I've left it, but maybe only temporarily. And then finally, I wanted to add this section onto my presentation of my NAFO ex experience. It's not been what I expected, it has been fulfilling, and it has been something that I've cherished and uh, hugely enjoyed, and, and you know, has helped me to make key decisions that have rounded my life. So, why new markets as a topic? <coughs> keep looking this way as well, rather than focusing on the market. If we look at the map here, the biggest cities in the world by population, 58% of those in 2020 will be in Southeast Asia. What's even more interesting on that, if you look at Africa, that's the next 29%. When we talk about our Western developed world, population-wise in 2020, it's not bringing in a big percentage. Asia is the fastest growing market in the world. It's got the fastest growing population. And my desire was to explore to see what opportunities there are for our meat industry. Now, medium rare was set up with the passion for provenance, welfare, and quality. So when I chose my topic, I was going with two aspects in mind. One, to see whether with a population growing, with a middle class growing, and with huge wealth growing, you could establish a high-end meat product out into Asia. What I found in Asia was that where we think of status symbols in the UK as cars, swimming pools, hotels, and holidays, the biggest status symbol currently in China is that of meat. They're going through a big transition from a carbohydrate diet to a protein diet. And I wanted to see whether there was the opportunity there to establish in their future a higher product. At the same time, from my experience in this country, we chuck quite a lot away. We chuck a lot of fifth quarter away, a lot away. And not only do we chuck it away, we have to pay to chuck it away. So is there the opportunity for a market for our waste products out into Asia? Let's see. So China, some stats to uh, blow your mind. China is a phenomenal country. I can give you stats on GDP. It's the third biggest economy in the world. It will soon become the first overtaking Japan and the US. What's more interesting is that China, let's not forget, is a developing country. Yes, in the next couple of years, it will be the biggest economy in the world. But if you look at its GDP to population, it actually only ranks 86 alongside Angola, Tunisia, and Albania. Their, their biggest problems are food security. And there are many stats out there. We read about China in the papers every day. But actually, if you look at the number of cities with a population greater than 2 million, in Europe, we have 36. In China, I think there's about 143 in total. In Europe, the biggest city is 12 million, which is London. In China, that doesn't even cut the size of the biggest cities. Uh, Beijing, I think, comes in at fourth of 24 million people. So, China's meat consumption. In 1995, it was, it, since 1995, it's gone up 112%. Having said that, it's still 45% less than the US. They eat 65% of their diet is pork, 20% is poultry, and 14% is red meat. And bear in mind that, that what they're eating now is only 25 kilos per year as opposed to 53 kilos in the US. They talk about the middle class in China, and the emergence of the middle class is what they say is a, is a population over 7,000 US dollars. At the moment, they think there's about 113 million of these, and these are the people spending the money. My travels, what did I want to do on my trip? I, I travelled to Australia, I travelled to Hong Kong, and I travelled to China, as well as going to the US for the Contemporary Scholars Concert. In Australia, I wanted to go and see a country that's already dealing with Southeast Asia, that's already maximising that opportunity. And while I was there, I had some really interesting trips. I was very fortunate enough to pop in and see the Ashes on Boxing Day, which was a key highlight. But uh, on, a, on the Nuffield side of things, I went, what I was... Uh, hit with was how far ahead they are, I think, in the terms to what we are. Australia have taken on a huge amount of research. They're bringing in all this research from the US and saying, what is the best eating quality meat? 
I get very frustrated in the UK. I know firsthand there are wonderful farmers out there doing amazing things with meat. The problem is, is that we're all doing it in different directions. And as a collective industry, our standard is not that highly regarded across the world. In, in Australia, they've worked out that the US, the best eating breeds, are actually now British breeds, Herefords, Angus, Redpolls. So why is it in the UK that we still concentrate on the limousines and the continentals that are typically lean and typically lack the flavour of traditional breeds? They've introduced uh, this concept of Meat Standards Australia, and I'm sure it's been spoken about here plenty of times before, but they have a concise criteria that meat has to meet for its proposed eating quality, and on that then they would give guidance on how it should be cooked, for what length, what, uh, whether it should be fried, stewed, boiled, or, and, and to get the best eating quality. I spent time at Lawson's and Angus, which was a beef breeding, uh, bull breeding farm. I suppose in Australia I focused on the beef side more because that's predominantly their export market. But they're doing wonderful work and they're now bringing in embryos of these Angus, and they are now exporting those embryos out to Southeast Asia. <coughs> But what's key is that they have this brand which is called Certified Angus. And the Certified Angus brand has a very strict criteria that is industry-led by the Meat Livestock Australia. And unless it meets these standards, it does not go under the banner. In the UK, my frustration has always been that we have these uh, quality controls, which I don't think are actually of quality, but of a basic requirement. They seem to have taken this a few steps further. So, with a hungover head this morning, I thought we'd have a look at Kowloon wet market. My highlight of going to Asia was to see how do they buy their meat. When you're in Kowloon wet market, fortunately I went into the winter, so it was only about 6 degrees, but in the summer, imagine this is 40 degrees, and there can be quite a stench. If there's a buzz, there's an atmosphere, and people are, are mixing in amongst the meats. They're not worried about where the animal comes from, they are completely at home in utilising every part of the carcass. What I found fascinating was that in the UK, butchery is an art form, it's a skill, and actually, uh, you know, it, it can look very attractive when done well. In China, the eating habit is completely different. What they value as uh, being a high-end product is what we add as a low-end product. They're interested in the bits of bone with little bits of meat on the side. They love the offals, feet, and noses are their penchant for a special meal. But how do they shop? They shop typically in these sorts of markets. You know, we hear stories of how they have kittens in cages and how they have chickens there and you kill it in front of you. It does sound gory, but actually it's an exciting way to go and do your shopping. There are all the ages in there. Uh, there are grannies in there, there are youngsters in there. And what we have to remember, if we want to go and export to these countries, we've got to understand how they eat their food and how they buy their food. We, as the UK, are, are always very, are becoming more and more proud of our food, and we think we are uh, becoming a culinary centre of the world. When you look at our food, it's actually pretty simplistic. We, we roast dishes, we fry dishes, or we stick meat and two veg in the oven and off we go. What they're doing here is they're creating stocks, they're putting spices, they're, they're frying, they're reducing. It's a far more complex cuisine than what he have. But as you can see from the video, they, they buy those products raw, they buy them in their basic form, whether it be a tongue from an ox or a tail from an ox with a hair still on it and they strip it away. So, where's China going now? Well, the supermarkets have arrived and they're all there. Tesco, Carrefour, Walmart, Metro are all present. Olé is another one that's arrived. Um, what they're having to do is embrace the wet market in a supermarket format. It would be arrogant for them to go in and, and think, well, if we we'll just roll out the Western, Euro Western European supermarket, this will work. What it has meant the supermarkets arriving is it opens up the market opportunity for us. And by having the big players like Tesco and Walmart in, this is a sort of chain things to What's brilliant though is that they have embraced the wet market culture. You can pick up your live turtle there. You can go and find your chicken feet. And one thing that I was told when I first got there, and it blew my mind a bit, was that a chicken foot is exactly the same price as a chicken fillet. And you can stand alongside a Chinese person, and they will be as baffled as you are as to why a chicken fillet is the same price as a chicken foot, as you were baffled why a chicken foot is the same price as a chicken foot. <laughs> <laughs> so, my focus was in Australia to see 
how they had people on the ground and how they were exporting, exploiting this market or making the most of it. The Meat Livestock Australia sees Southeast Asia as their key market for proximity, for growth, for population, and for the transition from carbohydrate to protein. They currently have 25 people on the ground in Asia working full time and promoting the, the standard Australian brand. Currently, you know, we are a way behind that. We have currently have two people in China through the ADHB. Now, I'm not, I'm actually here and I want to commend them on the work they're doing, but my belief is that we need to get behind them and push that further. People on the ground educating and creating supply chains of how we can do business out there is how we can grow the market and, and maximize the opportunity. Brands are out there. Boddington's is out there. If you look at the, uh, the, the Scottish shortbread, and what I particularly enjoyed about the Scottish shortbread was they put a French flag underneath it, which I think is <laughs> But then, in the supermarkets, they're embracing brands. They've got TVs of, of pigs there. They're showing where they're coming from. And I suppose, you know, there have been food scares, melamine being the, the most famous one in China. Um, and this has only reassured them the confidence of international brands. There is, you know, some concern about national brands from what happened with the food power. So my thoughts on China, and this is quite wordy, so don't, don't read it all, but with the income of the average Chinese person increasing, we can't expect them just to suddenly switch over to ribeye steaks the minute they get to 7,000 US dollars. It'd be naive. What we need to do is think about products that will sell in that market and to adapt our products to them, but with the reassurance of our values and our brands. I firmly, firmly believe how we produce food in this country, how we control our supply chain, our welfare, has significant value. Things sell at a high price in China. Boddington's was going at 10 pounds a can and it was selling well in their supermarkets because it was different, it was something that they couldn't get hold of and they liked it. What we have to make sure is we define what we want to sell and, and, and we can stand behind why it's going to be charged at an extra price. Status is important to Chinese people and they like to be seen to be doing well. They like to be seen in supermarkets. They like to be seen buying the latest clothing. Mercedes, I think 31% of their sales last year came in China alone, and that's a dramatic change. So, my pearls of wisdom for what I think we should be doing as the UK, and this is more generally to exports defining what we do. The UK is clearly defined as a message to export countries. Clarify what makes UK meat better, tasting better value, and create a system and process that ensures meat cannot leave these shores under the British label. I believe we should be focusing on what we are good at, on producing, using breeds that are high flavored, that are a, a more succulent fat content, and actually producing meat that tastes good. If we get this right, people will pay for it. They do it in every other sector of the market. If they like a handbag that looks good, they will pay more. If they like meat that tastes good, they will pay more for it. To unlock the potential of the Asian market, we need to push bodies like ADHB. They need to be the focus of how we're going to get out there. They need to put people on the ground. We need to give them more funding, and they need to actually orchestrate our interests. Two months before I arrived in China, the British Prime Minister was out there, and half the cabinet were out there. And that was um, a huge testament to where they see the future lying and how they want to push our growth out there. I'm going to move on because I'm running out of time. What has Nuffield done for me? It gave me some amazing opportunities to travel to the Great Wall of China, to eat Wagyu beef for the first time, and obviously to pop in on the ashes. But more for me, I started my Nuffield experience running my own company. I took the time away to think, to speak to other companies, and to reflect on what my position was. Unfortunately for me, the reality when I got back was that I couldn't carry on doing what I was doing, and it, and it was unanimously decided we needed to change the structure of what we did. What we did as a function is successful and still works, but unfortunately it couldn't support what I wanted to come out of it. So it's been a rethink, and as I stand here, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to say I'm no longer in agriculture, but that's not to say that in another 18 months' time my life might have taken a full circle again into a different industry, and I could well be meat or agriculture again. Thank you for your time and thank you for the number of experience.